My name is Hunter, and this is the Steps Together podcast, and I'm here with Paul Skulfer. Uh Paul, can you uh, tell us tell us who you are? Yeah, I can. Yeah, my name is Paul Skulfer, as you said. Um, I was the first British supermodel. I've been a TV presenter, been in movies, and I run my own charity for recovery. Love that. Love that. So you're you're in recovery yourself. Absolutely. So uh, so yeah, how how long have you been sober for? Uh, this August, hopefully, I will be 20 years. Nice. I nice. You can't tell by my face. <laughs> <laughs> well, and where uh, where'd you grow up at? Uh, I'm a Londoner, actually. I grew up in a place called Upminster, which is last London Borough East on a district line. It's okay. like a little, it's like a little Victorian sort of village or town um, where people used to move out from the East End if they'd done well. That's like toward that's toward Essex kind of. Somewhat. It's the last stop before Essex. It's actually um, it used to be Essex until 1965, um, but it's about a mile from the from the border, if you like. Okay, and uh, what was life like growing up? Amazing. That's why I'm in recovery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was good. I mean, I have my perspective of it. Um, I was born in the 70s, and England in the 70s, if you were middle class or working class, was pretty rough. Um, labor was in and tax on corporations at 98%. So a lot of people with money left the country. There was power cuts, three day work weeks. So <clears throat> as a kid, I knew stuff was going on. Um, but at the same time, the place in Upminster was good because you were connected to London, but also right next to my house, literally was the last house before the fields and woods. So I had a lot of time on my own out playing out. Um, so I, I'm trying to change the narrative for myself because I thought my upbringing was pretty rough, but in hindsight, a lot of it was good with rough, rough parts. Right. And like a lot of people say that, you know, childhood trauma influences, you know, you in turn becoming an addict later on in life. Do you think that you had any kind of like traumas as a child that potentially influenced that? Yeah, I did actually. Um, <clears throat> I've shut a few out, I know. Um, early on, we used to have a neighbor that would hurt me, put it that way. And um, I've tried to speak to my mum about it. And uh, I think she was she was a young mum, very busy. My father wasn't around. So um, I don't ask her too much about why things happen. But yeah, I, did, I had a neighbor who, um, you could call it torture or hurt. He'd, he'd put a noose around my neck and hung, hang me up in the garage and stuff. Um, I remember he shut my thumb in a door and nearly nearly took the thumb off once. Uh, my mum told me, I can't remember, the, I vaguely remember this bit, but she said that I came in with, uh, <clears throat> my head was bleeding and I had like nail marks in the top of my head where he'd put me in like a box thing and jumped on it and it come it'd come down onto my head. Um, so there was a lot of stuff there, um, and I was that was before I was six. So I have I, I I have I remember being like crushed and squashed in small places, but I disassociated and I, and, I, and um, a, a lot of it I can't remember, and you yeah. can hear it makes me like edgy to talk about it. That was one thing. Um, I think when I was seven, my grandma died. Um, my dad come in to the house and went, oh, you, you, your nan's dead. And I had a close relationship with her. I used to go to every Saturday morning and uh, <clears throat> jump in her bed for an hour at six o'clock in the morning, then wake up at breakfast and stuff. And I can't remember most of it. So again, I've probably disassociated from that. Um, one more one, if you want another one. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, my mum... We thought she was diagnosed with cancer. I was nine. Um, and she spent nine months in the London hospital. Um, so we'd go up there all the time. Uh, we found out later that she had neurofibrona. But basically, she she was like a five, five stone. Um, she had two big tumors taken out of her neck. And she was very unwell for a long time. So we used to go and visit her. And that was traumatic because my mum was my safe place. I loved her. We were a very close relationship. And to see her in that condition was tough. And my 
<laughs> my dad's an old East Ender. He's a good man, but he's he's he didn't have a toolkit either, you know. And and uh, so everything was black and white. So I <clears throat> I had to learn how to cook, be the man of the house early on, and take a lot of responsibilities there. And I don't think that's healthy for a child. But that's there's three for you. And what and what kind of because that's a lot as a child. What kind of feelings do you remember from back then? It's a good question. I remember fear and anxiety being paramount. Um, sometimes for no apparent reason. But I remember, um, I remember I used to pull my hair out. So I'd have patches on my head um, because I'd just... I think I was trying to escape and I'd just stand in the mirror and I'd just pull my hair out and look at it come out and think that's weird and just obsessively do that. Um, or I'd go and run over the fields and just escape. <clears throat> or I, would, I was a good athlete and I was a good gymnast and that was something that would take me out of feeling how I was. So a lot of the time I, I, I describe it as feeling like I was a broken bottle like shattered glass. And I only know that because I've learned through meditation how you can feel. So I thought it was normal at the time. But in retrospect, fear and anxiety was was paramount. So you were talking about escaping, you know. Um, so when did drugs start to play that role in your life? It's a good question. Um, they played them, They drugs played a part later, later on. Um, I think food was the first one for me. Escapism was the first one for me. And alcohol was a late starter. I think I was a late starter in using chemicals. Two reasons. Uh, I used to pass out and throw up quite a lot as a kid. And I hate that feeling. I still hate that feeling. I'm adverse to throwing up. And I think that was a savior for me. Uh, second of all, um, where I felt like life was an emergency, I was always hyper aware, super aware of stuff. And I didn't like the idea of not being able to react to a situation or get out of it if I had to. It was like being in the military, even though I've never been in the military, you know? <clears throat> so I kind of weaned myself onto drugs as I, as I look at it. There was a couple of times I, I class alcohol as a drug because it changes the way I feel, it changes my mindset immediately. You can go from being nervous to being super confident within 10 minutes of having alcohol. It's like a super drug. But then, for someone like me, it takes it all away, you know. So um, the first time I tasted alcohol, apparently I was four and we'd had a Sunday lunch and I just grabbed a glass of wine and downed it. And my mum said that I was calling my granddad silly names like Bugs Bunny and running around. They had no idea what was going on. And then they see the empty glass and he's like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> Uh, I have no recollection. Second time I touched alcohol was when my mum was in hospital. My grandfather took me to a pub and had a Guinness. And I really wanted to be like him. And I tasted it. I was like, what is this? this is awful. How can you drink that? And I tried it and he could see I was wincing. So he's like, we better get you an orange juice, kid. Uh, the third time of alcohol, we went on our first vacation to uh, Mallorca. And uh, my dad was saying to me, watch the boys we're going with because they, they're heavy brandy drinkers and they drink, please don't drink. So the first night I drank and I drank like them because I wanted to fit in. And all I remember was waking up feeling like someone had poisoned me on a bathroom floor in Spain with a towel over the door and the bathroom was flooded. So I was in, <laughs> I was in like two or three inches of water thinking, what the hell's happened here? But what I didn't understand, I was dehydrated uh, and, and I'd just come to and, and I tried to make myself feel different. That's what it was. And then my mum come in and um, she's like, "You've this is a hangover. That's it. So let's get some food and fluids in you. And I didn't drink after that for a while. Um, and with um, the first thing I was around were people were glue sniffing when I was probably 14, 15. I never wanted to try it. Um, again, I wanted to be in control in case something happened. So, so the fear saved me in a little while, for a while. And then people were smoking a lot of hashish when I was a teenager. And at the time, I was a competitive boxer from 15 to 18. Um, and I was obsessed with training. I was obsessed with being good. 
So I tended not to go there. But after that, I started to smoke as well. And then I did coke probably the first time when I was 19. And then I did acid the first time then. And then I just opened the doors open to, um, there was a great rave scene in the UK back then. And it was brilliant. Everyone was dancing and, and ecstasy pills were in. So for a few years, life was a high and it was good. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if it wasn't enjoyable, then you wouldn't have done it. You know, there was a time when it was enjoyable. I mean, say, I feel like everybody that suffers from this had that, you know, or they wouldn't go down that path. 100%. It, there, there's no reason. It's um, <clears throat> someone described to me one day that alcoholism or addiction is a disease, right? So you're at dis ease with yourself and you find a substance that makes you at ease with yourself. At one point, that won't work and you will be back at disease with yourself, whether you're using or not, then you're in trouble. So like at some point in your life, you were highly successful within your career. Um, but at that point you were already using drugs and alcohol. How were you able to like maintain both at the same time? I have a funny answer for that, but I'll give you a straight one. Uh, it was simple. Um, <clears throat> In the modeling business, you don't stay in one place, right? So it's not like being an executive. If you're in an office, you go back and stuff. So you can you can exit somewhere pretty quickly and leave the carnage behind. In the 90s, it was a different mindset. A lot of people were still partying, creatives were partying. It was more fun. It wasn't so corporate. Um, so it would be very usual to go on. I'll give an example. First job I did in Miami. I arrived in Miami. It was in a UK catalogue, which is no longer there. And I arrived, had no idea what was happening, met the crew. They're like, this is your per diem. And a per diem was an envelope of like, you had $50 a day for food and stuff. They're like, just spend that on what you want. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go out for the next five days and have fun. And then we're going to do the job for the back end of, the, of, the, of that. And um, I was like, okay. And have you ever been to a strip club, Paul? I was like, no. Well, we're going tonight. So we're going to have dinner first and we're going to a strip club. I'm like, okay, change your per diem for some dollars because you've got to tip the girls. I'm like, okay. So I had no idea what was going on. So I arrived, <laughs> I arrived we, we went in this big Winnebago, drove to the restaurants, great, went to the strip club. And I, I was surprised because I was new in the business and I thought it was going to be really important and very serious. And the photographer... <laughs> was absolutely wasted. The assistant was wasted. The producer was gone. I'm trying to keep up with them. And, um, and basically at the end of it, they said, who, who can, who, we're too blasted to drive. Who can drive? And I was like, I'll drive. Never driven on the left side. So I jumped in this Winnebago. It was parked. I remember in front of a bush, I thought, I'm just going to go forward. I can't reverse it. So I drove over the bush, <laughs> straight <laughs> into the road. And all I said was, <laughs> I could see the white line, so just tell me left or right. And, and and it took us about an hour and a half to get to South Beach from where we were, which was a 10 minute drive. Um, so yeah, it was, it was not unusual to do that back in the nineties. So do you find that the fact that you had like such like a public, you know, name that it made it hard for you to say that you were struggling with addiction because you were like in fear of what people would think of you or in fear of like losing jobs. Yeah. Two things. I never knew I was an addict and the circumstances I was in allowed that to progress, not blaming anyone. But like I said, <clears throat> um, I moved around a lot. So I lived in Paris, lived in Milan, We'd go down there for show season and work hard and leave. And when I was working initially, my main thing was to um, to learn about life, to grow. And fashion actually saved my life, I believe, personally. It took me out of a small town mentality. And I was just on a roll discovering things. Like my dad would say, yeah, these people are like this. And that country's like this, and it wasn't. I was like, this is not like what you told me. I'm experiencing different things. So early on, um, and also when you're 20, you can bounce back, can't you? You can go out and get absolutely whacked and have two hours sleep and just turn up. 
So I did a lot of that. But I also put work first and money first. So that that saved me a long a long time, I think, before things got really bad. And also, it's not a nine to five job. So you could work two months, have a month off, and go and do what you want, and then come back. So that allowed allowed that to happen. Um, I never asked for help because I didn't know I needed it, but I did source, um, you know, the mentality was like, oh, you'll be all right. Get over it. Go to the pub and have a drink or let's have a, let's go out and forget about your problems, which is the problem in the first place. Um, so I would sort of have conversations with girls I worked with, you know, it's a female dominant business. When I was younger, I was brought up mostly with women because my dad wasn't available and I prefer female company. So I'd always have good chats with people and, and ask them questions and stuff and try and assess if I'm that bad. And, and obviously, I had people around me that were worse. So I looked at them and thought, well, I'm not that bad yet, so I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, you, you know? were comparing with them. 100%. Yeah, it's easy. If, you, if, you, if you're someone who drinks a lot, just go with someone who's drinking worse than you and you feel better. You feel like the winner. If you go to normal people that are not drinking, then you can see exactly what's going on. So unbeknownst to me, I'd keep, keep that side of it, you know. But um, I'm a very private person anyway. Um, and I think because of my experiences in life, I'm quite resilient. Um, and also I earned a lot of money in the beginning. So what I would do is, um, for example, I bought a place in Miami, right, where I was living in New York, to go down and rest, get some sun. You know, that was my antidote at the time. And obviously that turned out to be my party place in the end because I was like, oh, no, she's actually better to party down here. <laughs> so that moved as So you well. went back to New York to rest. I went back to New York to rest <laughs> and work. So it was the boundaries was always pushed. But, yeah, at the time, for example, an, an agent would say to me, don't tell anyone you're going out of anybody. Always be slightly mysterious. Um, and don't tell anyone you have a problem. You don't have a problem while sitting there drinking and stuff like that. So it was very difficult. Um, what happened, um, I had um, a newspaper group that um, I've been in court with before that published um, some private information about recovery and stuff like that. So that's why today I'm happy to talk about it. But prior to that, I would never have spoke about it, not publicly anyway. <clears throat> and when you finally got sober, how did you get sober? Yeah, so finally what happened was um, I was I, I was just, I was in a dark place. For the last year, I was living in Los Angeles, right? Uh, and then something happened to my mum. She had, an, angi she had a, an angina attack, which I was told was a heart attack at the time. So I just jumped on a plane and come home and just left my place in L.A., and I was lonely at the time, like something was going on with me. I just felt really lonely. Um, I'd been really unwell for a long time, physically. And mentally, I was definitely not in a good space. I just thought I had depression or something. Um, I'd come home back to the UK to try and get some stability because I thought maybe it's Los Angeles, I don't know. And uh, I came back and I had a friend come over and... Um, I was trying to be good or I was trying not to party so much. But I was down to what I call a, a loop, right? So I could go about a month without drinking or using. And I'd hit the gym, hit some beds, hit the vitamins and stuff. And because of that, I thought I can't be an addict because I'm not using every day. I'm not in an alleyway. I don't wear a raincoat. You know, I'm not on a park bench. Yeah. And... um but I, you know, I was I was in a bad way. So a friend of mine had uh, an anniversary of the passing of his daughter, and they, he had a, a charity golf day and an event in the evening. And um, I hadn't used for about a week. I was on I was on a loop, like I said, it was three days, so I could stop for three days and the reason being I stopped for three days is because I was so hammered I'd just be on the couch out of it and then I'd just start again that was right at the very end that was literally the last six months 
and um, and I was <clears throat> I was just ashamed and embarrassed, and I didn't know I actually didn't know what to do, didn't know who to speak to. Um, and what happened was a friend of mine said, "Oh, can you grab some gear for me for this event?" And I was like, "You can't do that, mate. It's it's a it's a you know you can't behave like that." And um, anyway, I said, "Okay, I'll go and grab some stuff for you." So I grabbed about six six grams and um, drove home. Was getting dressed. I was ironing my trousers. And I got to the point where I would gurn and I couldn't breathe properly. Um, I didn't know how physically bad I was at that time, but I was in a bad way. Um, and I'd already done all of the stuff. I had about half a gram left while I'm ironing my trousers. And I got to drive to this place. So I'm driving down to this place and um, I'm on the, I think it was the A128 or something. And um, I just I just slammed the brakes on the car right in the middle of the road and started to punch the steering wheel and smash my face on the steering wheel. I guess I was having a breakdown. And, uh, yeah, I, it was bad. And then I punched the car. I just wanted to kill myself. I didn't understand at the time I was trying to kill what was going on in my mind. I just... Anyway, the phone rang and it was my friend. He's like, dude, where are you? But what are you doing? I was like, oh, um... Still couldn't be honest. I was like, oh, I just had a fight with two guys in a pickup truck, but I'm okay. He's like, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. So I drove on, went to this place. And, and when I got there, um, my friend was like, wow, what, are you okay? What happened? And my clothes were torn, bruised and stuff. And I was like, mate, I, can't, I, I, I need a drink. I need a drink to calm down. Like, can we go around the back? I was really paranoid. We went around the back to the bar and I just downed whatever it was, wine and, and Jack and Coke. And then the next thing, I'm standing there full of liquor and Coke and I'm standing on a table bidding thousands of pounds for a pair of boxing gloves I don't want to have and a fridge that I'm never going to use because I saw someone on the other side of that room that I knew from school that I was in competition with. And it was so, it was so sad and I thought, I've got, got to beat this guy. And then... Um, I drove people back to my apartment and then they went on into London and the guy, the guy there, a friend of mine, he's now dead. He, he uh, died of alcoholism, um, left a load of gear in the house. And I was like, please don't leave it because I'll do it. And, um, and I did all through the night and then I just collapsed in the morning. And what happened was it was very strange for me. I, I, um, when you said about asking for help, I just fell on my knees and and um, and this like voice come out of me. It was really strange. It was like, if there is a God or if there's a spirit or something, I need help. And then I just went unconscious. Really bizarre. And then, um, then I kind of came to, uh, I was on the phone, I, the, the phone was off the hook. I can't remember this. The phone was off the hook and there was some guy on the other end of the phone. <laughs> I was like, hello? And he's like, oh, yeah, you phoned me. I was like, sorry, I don't know who you are. And he goes, oh, we're the drug helpline. I was like, right. He said, yeah, and he started to tell me a story of recovery. And I was thinking, mate, you need a doctor. I'm the one who needs help. I didn't understand the process. Anyway, he said, look, there's a meeting in Shoreditch, a sobriety meeting, why don't you go? So I got a jacket on and a shirt, and I thought, okay, I'll go to this place, thinking that there's going to be a doctor there or a nurse going to be all structured and I, I walked up on this um I'd love to know who he was he was a northern guy in a shell tracksuit which was slightly out of date by then but gave me a hug he's like hey man how are you I was like I'm okay uh is there a meeting here he's like yeah just go in there and I walked in this room and there was a load of people talking about uh their problems and stuff and I'm thinking what is this someone offered me a tea and then um Someone said, are you a newcomer? And I was like, I, I don't know what a newcomer is, mate. I've just arrived. And these people started to clap. Well, I've been out of it for three, you know, like a three-day bender. And these people are clapping in this church hall. And I'm thinking, what the hell is this? And I was not right. And, and, and I left. And what I did, I went to a friend of mine who's the straightest person I know. 
I went to his house and, and, and it was the weirdest thing. It's the first time I've ever asked for help or said to someone, I've got a problem. I'm on the doorbell, he answers the door and I burst out crying. I was like, I have a massive problem with drinking, a massive problem with drugs. Um, and, and I don't know what to do. And it makes me emotional. And, and, and he hugged me, brought me in. He's very practical. He's like, right. He said, um, I think you need to go to rehab. And I was like, whatever that is, that's fine. And um, so we looked him up, found the closest one, phoned him up, drove to the rehab. And um, I remember this therapist called Patty, who was amazing. Um, and another lady come and interviewed me. And... Uh, she said, what's what's going on? What's happened? She, you know, she had asked me questions. <laughs> and I basically said, oh, I'm okay. I just I just went out a bit too long for the weekend, but I'm okay, really. And she's like, yeah, maybe you're not. Maybe you want to come in. And I agreed to because at that point I was so exhausted with life. I couldn't talk to people in a way of, I was so self-conscious, so much full of shame. Um. And I wasn't a bad guy, I was just unwell. And I didn't I didn't understand that at the time. So I went back home to get some clothes. So I thought I'd dress nicely for this rehab. And on the way back, my friend said, do you want to stop off for something to eat? And I knew that if I had a big bowl of pasta, that I'm kind of intolerant to it, so it made me feel sleepy and, 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 and I ordered the biggest glass of wine you can have. I should have took the bottle and gone in in that way, but I had this big glass. And I really weirdly remember drinking it, thinking this might be my last glass of wine. And um, and only because my friend was so straight, what I really wanted to do is take about three bottles and drink them in the car before, as we was going down there. But we went in there and um, and I didn't really understand the process for a couple of weeks, but that was the start of my sobriety um, and I was quite defiant. I didn't think I had an alcohol problem. I knew I had a drug problem. Um, but one day, probably two weeks in, I'm not sure, I was legging it out of the gate, <laughs> running down the high street, because I, I, I heard there was a pub down the road, and I thought, if I go in there and I have some, just a couple of pints, maybe a couple of scotches, I can go back in the rehab and, and, and then... I can deal with what they're telling me. And at that point, a, a, a coin dropped. And I was like, shit, I need to have alcohol or something in my body to deal with what's going on. And what's going on is me. And it just, it gives me chills now. And I walk back, towel between my legs, very emotional. And I'm like, I, th I think I might have a drink problem. This is like two weeks in and I went, we think you do, Paul, yeah, would you like to stay? I was like, yeah. And actually from that day, I, I rebooked myself in for another 28 days. And um, what was good about the rehab was they took us to meetings and they had meetings in there, so outside people come in. And I must say that <clears throat> around the second week, um, I contemplated, I decided, I, I was contemplating suicide and then I made a decision that, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to take myself out. It wasn't emotional. It was very calm. Um, I sat on my bed in there. I looked out the window and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. And um, I was thinking about how to do it. And then weirdly the phone rang in the room and um, it was my friend. And he's like, how are you doing? And I, and, and I said, how did you get through? You're not supposed to run. He goes, I just, I just asked, they put me through. And he said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm not, I'm not good. And my voice was different. It, it, it really lowered into this kind of peaceful voice. And I said, I'm not good. And he said, I can hear that. He said, I'm coming to see you tomorrow. I've got something for you. And I thought, fucking hell, I've got to fucking, that's mixing my plans up. Okay. And then... After hearing his voice, it took me out of my thought process. And I have, at the time, I had two beautiful nephews that I was close to. And I thought, if I kill myself or remove myself from this planet, how, how are they going to be 
it's the first time I've thought about someone else in that way. I'm thinking, I can't be that uncle. To, to, they'd be devastated because when I was younger, my nan passed, it hurt me really badly. So I thought I'd do the same to them. I couldn't do it. So then I made a decision at that point not to do that. And that if I'm here anyway in this body and I'm here in this rehab and I'm going to do this recovery thing properly, I'm going to do it properly. And, and at that point, so it's a really strange day. At that point, I made a decision to be in recovery, find out what it is, how do you do it, how do I want to be here? Um, and they gave me a book, and in the book, uh, I just, I don't, I'm dyslexic, so I didn't like reading, but I opened it and I read this one sentence that said, we can look the world in the eye. And I thought, when was the last time I looked at anybody in the eye? Like, where have I been? Oh my God, what happened to me? Where have I been? And it's, it just dawned on me where I'd, where I'd got to in my life. And, and that was the beginning of my recovery. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> what, can you explain the difference between sobriety and recovery? That's a good question. I don't know whether I can. I think sobriety for me is not just putting down alcohol or drugs. That's for me is not sobriety. That's just putting something down. Sobriety, uh, it sows into recovery for me. So sobriety for me is, is getting help, putting down whatever chemical or outside source you're putting into your body. Um, so landing into that place, making the decision that you want to get better. And recovery for me is working on myself on a daily basis um, with a goal of moving further and further away from alcohol and drugs or the desire to use them or really the need to use anything to change the way I feel or change the way I think. Recovery for me is having a community of people like yourself, that we have a common goal, like a football team, the common goal is to get the ball in the net and let's win, is to, is to deepen ourselves in honesty, um, to want to live into this space, being myself, that, that's recovery for me. Amazing. And how crucial do you think treatment for addiction and mental health is? I think it's crucial. It depends on the person. Um, and we touched earlier on a place like Steps Together, which I think is uh, run by a brilliant guy and it's a really good organisation. For me personally, I needed to go into treatment. Why? Because for a couple of years before, I was trying to uh, mend myself without the knowledge and out the tools. Um, I'd read self-help books, I'd try different things, but it never touched the centre. I got hypnotized for trauma. I, I got loads of things done. I, I tried to really do something without the tools. It's like someone trying to build a house with no experience. You'll do, you'll put something up, but it's not going to be, you know, viable to live in. Um, so for me, it was to land in a safe space where people were trying to do the same thing. So I didn't feel like the odd one out. And you know what it's like. It can be if you're going in a pub. Um, and everyone's drinking and you're not, you look like the one that's got the problem, not the people that are drinking, right? Why aren't you drinking? What's going on? What's wrong with you? Uh, nothing, I'm just having a lemonade. But that's weird what you're doing. You know, you can't do that in that environment. You have to change change your environment. If you're with people that are sitting there puffing, you're not going to be on the same wavelengths. So you can't communicate. So for me, going into a treatment centre, especially 12-step based, was an introduction into recovery itself. So I started to understand the language um, because if you speak to someone in recovery, right, and you're not in it, it's like weird. There's a whole other language going on. Yeah, You know, it's like probably speaking to someone who's done a PhD in whatever, metabiotics or whatever it is. Um, it's a different language. It's a different, different terminology. So it was really lovely for me to also not have to deal with life outside, deal with bills and deal with people. I just Distractions. All the distractions. What are important and what seems to be important, paramount before you go in, then you can get to realise it's you. 
and what you need to do for you, you know? And, and when I went into treatment, there was a guy, I thought, I'm not like these guys. I'm a little bit different, you know? They're a bit, you know, they've got more problems than me. Totally in denial. Didn't understand what denial meant. And there was a guy got brought in called Peter. I won't say where he's from, but he was a London guy. Tattoos. Pitbull, like proper, he looked like he had kids for a living. And he used to sit there staring at me and he got brought in by armed guard. And I thought, I can't not stare at him. I got to stare at him as well. I mean, I'm not going to show I'm scared. <laughs> and uh, and it, it got really silly. And uh, we left, we left one, we left one day for a walk. He had to walk around the grounds. And I was like, I can't stand this tension. So I just said to him, Pete, you're scary. You terrify me. He goes, you you keep staring at me. You're quite scary yourself. I went, dude, come on, look at you. And uh, and then we, st I made a joke and we had a laugh and stuff. And then he told me about some things that happened in his childhood. So I related to him and said things that happened in my childhood. And all of a sudden, it's the first man that's a man's man that opened up and I opened up to him. And we literally, it sounds strange, but we literally held hands together. And he was a fighter. He was like a cage fighter and whatever. And I used to box. We held hands in this like, um, like a brotherly strength way. First time it's ever happened to me. And walked and said, I think we're going to be okay. You know, when we started to share stuff and um, what we did do, which was a mistake, <clears throat> was I was like, we're not allowed to train in here. I love training. Should we do a little bit of sparring? So like, yeah, let's do it. So there, there was like a like a clay room or something they used to do in the back of the building. So we took our shirts off. We just had jeans on and started to go to it in the back, like just no headshots, but like body shots. And there was a little bit of blood from his ring and I cut him with mine. And, it, and then the bell rung and then all the staff come out and they're like, what's going on? We've heard two people are fighting. And me and Pete just sweating, just that. It was amazing. For an ex-fighter, it was so nice to do. It's like the first relief or something. And they're like, we went straight to the office and like, you guys are going to get sectioned if you don't stop this behavior. And I was like, listen, you don't understand what it's like. We need to have a bit of exercise or whatever. Anyway, we laughed about it. But um, that community that I found in treatment, only the ones that wanted it, like Peter at the time, helped me to be like, oh, you know what? I want to do this. This is, this is, I feel safe in here. I can share stuff. I can't tell my family. I can't tell my friends. And it was a safe place for me to, to grow, you know? Is, uh, is being of service to people a big part of your recovery? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've always been a good person in the sense, like my, I learned from my mum. There used to be an old lady down the corner called Maud who was in her nineties and when she walked past, my mum would help with her bags. My mum was always that kind person, so I learned to be kind off of her. But as well as you know, being in addiction, you don't have time for anyone because you're stuck in self thinking about how you're gonna get through the day or what you're gonna do. And um so I love being a service. My um my sponsor told me I said to him, how do I go back into work? How do I become a model again? Because I'm too scared of going back to it. Um, I don't want to be triggered or whatever people, language people use. And he said to me, you can help people in that business that need recovery secretly, like a secret agent. You can talk to people and stuff that I can't get to. So that weirdly gave me a purpose to go back into the fashion industry. And weirdly, unlike my second job, I was having my hair done. And um, he said to me about being a service. So go there for the client, go there for the photographer, go there for the stylist, do your job properly and, and be of service for, for that rather than just going there to try and be the celebrity, which is what I was taught how to be. You know, before it was all about you, you had to be cool, funny, to be desired. Um, so I learned on the first job, there was a, the, the makeup artist looked a bit nervous and she said, oh, let's just keep this simple, shall we? And I heard this tagline that you hear in recovery and I was like, are you in recovery? 
actually I didn't. I said, are you friends of blah, blah? And um, she's like, yeah, you? She's like, yeah. I'm like, uh, I think it was like a year and a half or something. I was like, I'm like, a year and a half? She's like, oh, I'm four years. And I was like, oh my God. And I thought she was the crazy one because she was always laughing, but she was in recovery. And I realized that she was free of um, self-consciousness and stuff. So I, it gave me a, an angle to go back into the business and be of service in that sense to, for me. Um, and then my wife and I um, opened a charity called Stride Foundation UK. It's very grassroots. It's been only her and myself that run it. And what we wanted to do was I was fortunate enough that I could pay for treatment. Um, and a lot of people can't. And at the time, you could either go to the NHS, get a detox in or a home detox. And that was it. Or you go to a 12 step program, which a lot of people was too scared to go to. So we wanted to fill the gap. Um, and I explained to you earlier about we had a deal with a treatment center where um, they would allow us a couple of beds. So people would come to me and would put them into treatment. And we've done it mostly through people we know in the recovery world or friends of a friends. So it wasn't really public, even though we formed the charity and we did like a uh, a public event to raise money with some celebrities and we intertwined it with the Amy Winehouse Foundation. So um, that turned into helping people having um, therapy and stuff, especially in lockdown. A lot of people would phone me up and say, listen, my cousin, my friend, someone I know, can you help them? So we'd put them into seeing one of our therapists we work with. And it gives you a warm feeling when someone can't afford something and they really want it with treatment or whatever. Um, so being a service, I've done it through my charity. Um, I've done it personally where I'd, I'd spend usually like a couple of hours a day on the phone to men. I only work with blokes um, to mentor them or help them come into recovery or deal with life situations in recovery itself. Um, and I've retrained really as a mindset coach so that I had the legitimate tools as well as experience you know, I've had a lot of 20 years of experience nearly um, to help people. So it is for me paramount. Yeah, for sure. If somebody was in active addiction and they actually wanted help, what wisdom could you share with them? Yeah, it depends on that person, obviously, and depends where they live, what situation they're in. The biggest step someone told me before is the doorstep into somewhere for help, right? It's the first step into, and that's asking for help. And I think for most addicts that I speak to and have spoken to, they don't want to ask for help, A, because they feel that it's everyone else's fault, and some of it is because of trauma and stuff, but, um, or they're not that bad yet. Even though they've lost their house, their car, their family, they're in a bed sit somewhere, you know, they still think they're okay. Um, and you've got to remember, um, when you're, when you suffer from real trauma, bad experiences, that compounds with what you've probably done, the lines you've crossed, getting drink or drugs, obviously depending, shameful situations, that compounds emotionally inside of you. And most people don't want to admit that they need help because they're fighting. They're fighting the world. Actually, they're fighting themselves, but they think they're fighting the world still. If if this happened to you, what would you do? You know, you'd have to you'd have to get take the pain away. And alcohol and drugs is amazing at killing mental and emotional pain. It is. It's a, it's it's a solution at one point. But like I said earlier, with a disease analogy, when it stops working, you're left on your own, and it will stop working. So you've got two choices. You either go to the end and die or some people go into an institution or you, there's a, the third solution is finding sobriety as foreign as it sounds and against all your thought process that you've learned, like, oh, you know, whether it started out as let's go and party, let's crack some cans open or let's have a smoke or whatever that life you've lived to know you've got to change is unbelievable. Some people would rather die than change their whole dialogue, right? Because you think it's the end, you don't realize it's the beginning or a possible beginning, right? You feel like it's the end. And 
it's not. It's the beginning. It's the end of your denial, your pain, your fear, all of the stuff that was weighing you down, that was traumatizing you, that gave you the inability to communicate, that gave you... This is what people don't understand about uh, someone who suffers from addiction, whether you're living in a 30 million pound mansion in Beverly Hills or you're on the street somewhere, it's the same internal process, is that that's noisy. Your head is like sitting in a, a TV studio with 20 screens and loads of speakers playing different things. And you're, you're trying to manage your life with that stuff going on. That's what people don't talk about. And that can go, or at least turn the volume so far down that you can hear and be present. So recovery is a beginning to a new life, right? And I thought, you know, from my experience of, you know, I've had a lovely life. I've been on, you know, I come from a normal background. I've been on private planes and 130 meter yachts and big places in Beverly Hills and penthouses and parties and supermodels and actors. And it's amazing. And I thought, oh, my life's over and it's just me that's had this thing. But coming into recovery, after asking for help, the first thing I did was ask my friend, right? And you can't ask anyone. You can't ask your drug dealer for help because he'll just say, yeah, have another one of these. That'll help you, you know? Or you can't ask the barman that you sit on the pub store at, uh, you know, hey, Dave, I'm feeling like I'm drinking too much. What do you think? Have another beer and we'll talk about it. That's the wrong place. So depending what country you're in, but here's great because you have like helplines for the NHS. You have Frank. You know, we have stuff on our website. You can Google anything like Steps 2 on there. They have great stuff on their website. So help's there. It's in abundance. And there's some good people in recovery. There's not great people as well as in every part of life, but there's some good people. And what I've learned after I helped is that I've got a second innings. I've got a new way of life and I have a new mindset and I'm enjoying myself and it's different. Life's not so dark and I'm not trying to fight the pain because I've sat in it. I've worked on mine to the point I've been in fetal position on the floor for a day, like, you know, and that's been the best thing for me because I faced my fears, I faced my pain and now I'm free of it most of the time. So I would say that if you have access to the internet, look at, phone numbers that you can phone, the Samaritans or whatever, as a first step. Or you can phone a 12-step program like an AA or a CA and just speak to someone. And, you know, there's someone I know at the moment who won't do that because they're like, what if I get arrested? What if they, all them questions. And I'm like, you, you just got to have a faith. Most of these people have been where you are and they're trying to help. So I would say that is ask for help but go to the right place for us for it is the first step and the biggest thing you can do. How has sobriety changed your relationship with your loved ones? I have a relationship. Mm. I'm, I'm kind of lucky for me that, as I said, cause I traveled so much. Um, I've formed some deep relationships, but a lot of them was fair weather friends. You used to party with them, leave and stuff. Um, the most, the best relationship is the one I got with myself because I never wanted to be, um, I didn't want the feelings and the thoughts I had. So I didn't want to be me a lot of the time, even when I was super successful inside, it was painful and it's not a poor me story because now I'm grateful for it all. But, um, I got married in sobriety. So the relationship I have with my wife is deeper than any other relationship I thought I had smoking a joint with a hot girl on a cabana somewhere by the ocean thinking this is it, this is deep and intimate. Um, the communication we have is incredible. She has my, she can have my phone if she wants, she can have my, she can have anything she wants. I have nothing to hide. Don't want to have anything to hide. She knows I'm honest with her. I'm honest with myself. I have a wonderful relationship with my kids. You know, I, I try and treat them for all the stuff I wanted. It's like, whew. all the stuff I wanted to have as a kid. So I don't want them to have all the pain I had. So I have a, a deep relationship with them. 
I have a deep relationship with my friends in recovery. <sighs> Sorry, someone's here. The old pain comes up. So it's, <clears throat> I'm grateful for that. I have a good relationship with my mum now. I have a relationship with my father that I've worked on to have a relationship because I could have easily said I don't want one. Um... I have deep relationships with friends in recovery that I didn't think, you know, I've had some friends for like 40 years that don't know me properly. And I can have some, like with you, we could sit there for an hour and we'd know each other better than anyone. So having that ability to gauge who you can talk to as well and have those relationships is, is just amazing. And I'm really grateful for that because um, I went back to, like I talk a lot to my aunties, I talk a lot to... I even talk a lot to like um, my first girlfriend's dad, who I think was great, and other people. So I've built deeper relationships that I thought I had before, but I had no idea, you know. And and uh, so yeah, I think I'm. I think at the moment, it's uh, um, I'm grateful for those. It's good. Uh, you've accomplished a lot throughout your life, but what do you think is the most fulfilling thing? That's a great question. You know, I sat at Chateau Marmont in Hollywood, sitting there having breakfast when I was about four years sober with a photographer who I met. And he sat there and he said to me, uh, I won't do my American accent because yours is obviously better than mine. But he sat there and he's like, hey, bro, you know, he said, uh, it's a shame you never made it in life. And I looked at him and it jarred me for a minute. And I thought, never made it in life. What do you mean? And his metric system was fame, fortune, and names. Who I'm, he's a photographer who I'm shooting, where I've been and stuff. And, and that was his goal. That was it. That was just it. And I thought at that time, I'm four years sober. You don't know what it takes to do the work you have to do on yourself, right? I said, I come from a normal background that had no connections with celebrity. I've been in movies. You know, I've been, been a top model. I've worked with loads of amazing, talented, fantastic people. Made great relationships with some lovely women. I've bought a lot of the toys I've had. I've got the watches I had. I've done stuff that I never thought was feasible. And I've put a lot of that behind me to live this life of sobriety. So I'm very successful. But for a minute, he he done me for a minute because I thought, oh, yeah, I didn't quite make this and I didn't quite make that. <clears throat> so I've realized in life that people have a different metric system. And my measurement now is having a, a wonderful sober life where I don't need to take any substances to relate to people, to work, to be successful. So I think there's a different metric system there, you know. Uh, th this was the Steps Together podcast. Um, thank you, Paul, for coming. It was honestly, that was touching. It's a pleasure, my friend. Much appreciated.